Awesome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our talk on Ida Halpern here at the Bill Reed Gallery. My name is Olivia Cox, and I am the Indigenous Programming Intern here. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are currently on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. We are constantly working towards improving our relationship with those whose lands we occupy, and we aim to do so in a way that is both respectful and productive. Keeping the Song Alive was created through a partnership between the Jewish Museum and Archives of British Columbia and the Bill Reed Gallery of Northwest Coast Art. I'd like to acknowledge our presenting sponsor, Blue Shore Financial. We are also gratefully acknowledge the financial support of the province of British Columbia through the 150 time immemorial grant program of Heritage BC and through BC Arts Council. We'd also like to thank City of Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, the Israeli Foundation, the Jewish Federation of Greater Vancouver, Harbor Air Seaplanes, and the Rosedale on Robson Suite Hotel. So today we have David Gordon Duke here to give a talk on Ida. For those who aren't aware, Ida was an ethnomusicologist whose work with the indigenous people of the northwest coast of British Columbia in the 1940s was a major component in preserving traditional song and potlash music. Our exhibition, Keeping the Song Love, highlights this achievement and speaks to the contemporary kwakwakwak ways of honoring traditions like these songs that Ida helped to preserve. Today, David will be here to speak on Ida and her work. David is a Vancouver music composer, educator, writer, and music critic. He worked under Ida Halpern from 1978 to 1980 and 1984 to 1988. We also have Michael Schwartz here today to facilitate this talk. Michael worked alongside our curator Beth Carter and guest curator Cheryl Wadhams in order to bring this unique collaborative exhibition to reality. Thank you for listening to this quick introduction and I hope you enjoy the talk. The talk will conclude around three, and we will have room for questions afterwards. Thanks, Olivia. And thanks to everyone for joining us today and to the Bill Reed Gallery for hosting us today. Um, pleased to reintroduce David and welcome him here today as our special guest. Um, perhaps you'd like to start telling us a bit about how and when you met Ida Halper and how you came to work with her. Well, it's always good to start at the beginning, <clears throat> but um, I don't come in at the beginning of the Ida Halpern saga. Uh, I come in in the 1970s when I was a student, and um, we, I don't want to use film terms, but we did have an unusual first, uh, first encounter, because I was working as, a, uh, as an office gopher at a summer music program on Vancouver Island, and my boss, J.J. Johannesson, who ran the program, uh, called me into the office and said, now we're bringing in a guest, Dr. Ida Halpern, who's going to come and tell all the students about First Nations music. I don't think he was particularly interested in this particular topic, but he nonetheless uh, thought it was useful to, uh, to do this, and uh, I got the assignment of assignments, which was, and you are to keep her happy and make sure everything goes according to plan. Got it? And um, I, I sort of thought, oh dear. <laughs> All right, well, I, I think I can do this. So I, I was introduced to Dr. Halpern, who came over uh, to Shawnigan Lake for this, this production. And um, being a practiced professional, she knew exactly what she was going to do. She had a film which had been made by the Encyclopedia Britannica, which she was going to show, and she would have her speech ready to go. And, uh, you know, my involvement consisted of checking to make sure the projector would work, and uh, then, and this is where it gets interesting, sitting around um, on the deck of uh, her hotel, uh, having afternoon tea and maybe even a gin and tonic, and, uh, and talking. And because my background um, is um, a musicology, um, and I was having my first crack at doing a doctorate at that particular moment, um, I was absolutely fascinated by the opportunity to have any time at all with someone who could um, remember and tell me the nuances of <clears throat> musical life in Vienna in the 30s, in the 20s, who met people who were some of the great, the great figures in classical music.
lost regard and that I cared about music. And um, um, I changed your group coalesced. And you could read the founders of Friends of Charity. You could read a very amusing book on their 25th anniversary, which is simultaneously one of the most discreet and indiscreet publications I can imagine, where we talk about how we were able to lure great string quartets to Vancouver and why we went in certain directions. The founding of this institution no longer would count as something, something huge. But it should have the advantages, too. And we'll get this out of the way now, I suspect, uh, which is to say that if you were able to broadcast, which she was, and if you were able to teach, which she did, though not as effectively as her at UBC, and above all, once you have that marvelous weekly, or even every couple of days, pulpit of a regular newspaper column, well, then you can have quite a lot of effect. And uh, the model of Friends of Chamber Music in the early days was we will compel them to come. And uh, <laughs> that's pretty much the missionary zeal behind this sort of thing. Um, it was exactly the right time for this, but it was also the right constituency of available and interested people. There was a little bit of money, never enough, but things were able to be done at that point. If you look at the late 40s and we have the establishment of the Faculty of Music at UBC, not a good thing from Holland's perspective, but you know, important thing for the city. You have friends of chamber music, you have a new uh, approach to things in the Vancouver City. And as it she, in her columns and in her occasional broadcasts, was able to promote what she thought they would be promoted and was a part of uh, this notion of recreating a sort of um, Vienna light environment for, for classical music uh, here in the Pacific Fishing Village. When we read her uh, columns in Providence or her listen to her broadcast on, on the radio, there's definitely an educational aspect to what she's talking about. She wants to, no, you don't? Oh, have, no, duh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, the propaganda plus education. And she wants people to understand the value of the, the music and how to, and how to and she uh, appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we don't use the term music appreciation anymore, although uh, it was the thing back in the 40s and but this was a no musical literacy of being able, I think in, in Canada, we, we had that notion that you do piano as a kid, or whatever, and you do your exams, and then you grow up and spend every week again. She was after the idea of creating an educated body of listeners who would support, who would understand, who would be able to do this. Um, and that was, uh, that was a mission. It wasn't the central mission, because that was, of course, the, the preservation but this was something that she was also hugely interested in, in doing and devoted a fair amount of time to. And she was also ruthless. Um, her, her, her criticism, per se, was never vicious, the way the English tradition of music criticism can sometimes be. But on the other hand, it was obvious that some things were more important than others, and some performances were better than others. And, uh, um, and there we are. If I can just editorialize for a second. When I started, by again accident, writing for the Vancouver Sun, um, I did the proverbial, I don't know whether I can do this. I haven't really trained as all of this, and I was at a concert, uh, where a Tibetan tenor was singing uh, an aria from a Viennese operetta by Lehar. I didn't know what to do. And then this sort of little voice came and said, but David, isn't it wonderful that even a Tibetan tenor wants to sing from the Merry Widow? And it was this um, trying to look at things through her rather expansive and very encouraging approach that, that I found got me over the, the first little, little hurdles. But, oh, absolutely standards and absolutely um, it's not her phrase, but I'm, but mine. It would be criminal to have educated people who didn't understand the value of music. Mm. So that was one of the things she did. Well, it seems that her sense of standards was from an attitude that Vancouver can and should have art to match the quality of anywhere else on, on the planet. Absolutely. 
absolutely. So, you know, things like the great failed Vancouver International Festival was something that she thought was, was important. She was on the board of the symphony. She was made an honorary life president of the, of the VSO, et cetera, et cetera. So, now, she was not unique in this because there were a whole lot of other people, and this is where I can sort of turn the tables, Michael, on you and, and say, how did, we know that the West Coast uh, received people from um, not just Central and Eastern Europe. I think of the French composer Darius Mio, who was from Provence, but knew that Paris wasn't a good place to be during the first, the Second World War, came and lived in Oakland, taught people. Uh, explain how Vancouver, from your perspective with the Jewish Museum and Archive, changed really within a 50, uh, a 10 year period, 35 through 45. Um, I don't know if I can comment quite on the, the cultural shift, but I, we do know that there was a huge influx of immigrants, refugees, uh, preceding the war and following the war, probably we'll say from 1936, 1950 thereabouts, um, folks coming from uh, Poland, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Germany, um, France, as you say, at times Lithuania, um, the whole area as it became affected, uh, different part, Hungary, uh, different parts of Europe become affected by the Nazi invasion at different, peri at different moments. Um, and people realize they have to get out of there if they want to survive and if they want to you know have a thriving life and so some were able to go by way of England uh, for instance sending youth were able to take the kinder transport to England um, to, to escape uh, Germany and Austria others had to find other ways um, going by way of uh, Shanghai there was a huge historical Jewish community in Shanghai for hundreds of years and um, there was a the Japanese ambassador to Lithuania was signing visas Sugihara uh, making it possible for people to go there and, and a lot of people didn't know what to expect in Shanghai or if they'd be stuck there forever or if there was really much of a community but they knew that it was better than staying in Europe um, and once there, they were able to figure out ways to, to continue on to North America. Um, and uh, coming from when you leave Asia, you're going to land on the West Coast. And some people didn't know what to expect here on the West Coast, whether it's Seattle, San Francisco, or Vancouver. Um, but I guess arrived and figured out it's not so bad. Um, others, like came by way of the Atlantic and uh, the Canadian government uh, for people arriving in Halifax or Montreal would encourage them to go to the prairies because it, it, the cities were getting overpopulated. They wanted to populate the, um, the prairies and so you could get, you know, as long as you stayed there for a year or two and improved the land, which was to say build a structure and make it farmable, then you could move on. Uh, and so people tried it out and realized they weren't much of farmers <laughs> and realized how terrible the winters are and then uh, found ways to carry on either to Winnipeg or to Vancouver. Um, and that's kind of how a lot of people wound up here, uh, basically as far as you could possibly get from the horrors of Europe. Um, and because there wasn't the same, I guess, infrastructure for a Jewish community as there was in Montreal, which is to say, you know, kosher food and many synagogues, there was a handful of synagogues, um, and kosher food was extremely expensive. A lot of people uh, lived a very secular life here, and in fact, many who came from the urban centers of Europe had lived a secular life there. Um, and so they participated in building up a Jewish community. There were some who were quite observant and were more engaged, but the kind of uh, group pocket that uh, Dr. Halpern and George Halpern would have been a part of would have been 
less observant and more interested perhaps in reviving or bringing a seed of a Central European highbrow culture that, that you've been describing and getting that founded here. This, of course, touches on exactly the, um, the, the, Halpernian, the Halpernian, I guess, is the, uh, the form I want journey because they, um, when things are starting to deteriorate in Vienna, they, are, they spend a year in Italy, in Milano. Uh, they go back. She finishes her dissertation uh, with all sorts of problems, but finishes it, and then they leave, and they go to Shanghai, where George Halpern, Dr. George Halpern, the, her husband, has a sister who's uh, a psychiatrist and who's working in, in Shanghai. Shanghai, after the Japanese invasion, is, is just more of the same, and they get on a boat to come to Vancouver with the intentions of then going directly to Toronto, and they stop, and they like the view, and they seem to like the climate, and, uh, and roots are, are put down. Um, there's a story um, which may be part legend, but um, I think is got an emotional truth to it, which is when asked by the customs immigration officer on arriving in Vancouver, what are you going to do here, lady? Um, well, I think I'll probably study music of, of uh, she would have said the Indians of the Pacific Northwest Coast. We, uh, we don't use that phrase in the same way anymore, but, uh, and apparently the customs guy or immigration guy said, good luck to you, uh, you know, that's music, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now, Ida Halpern could be quite stubborn. That's one reason why she succeeded in so many things. And I think this notion of, I know about this stuff. We studied some of this back at the university. And here, where it's from, they don't understand it. They don't think it's music. They don't think it's important. They don't see it as significant. I wonder to what extent that uh, sort of irritant uh, may well have fueled some of her, uh, I'll use the word collecting, but I really mean preserving zeal. Uh, certainly, one of the things that fascinates me is how quickly she ingratiated herself with uh, the movers and shakers of Vancouver. She got to know people pretty quickly. She got to know uh, Lauren Harris, the painter, who was spending his war years in Vancouver. Uh, because if I, I'm not an art historian, but I understand he couldn't get dividend checks in Mexico where he had been living <laughs> and had to come back to, uh, to Canada and had a big old house on, on Belmont uh, out near the university. Um, she started teaching what we will call now music appreciation courses for uh, the extension department at UBC. I have a personal connection to that because my great aunt Matilda, and I am the sort of person who does have a great aunt Matilda, took the courses and uh, the, uh, before I had the famous meeting at Shawnigan Lake, I knew about Dr. Halpern because she was spoken of in hushed tones of great reference as this marvelous expert on music. And um, we have just down the, uh, down the aisle here in the case, uh, one of her uh, personally printed music appreciation books that she used for her, her UBC courses. Indeed, she was very proud of the fact that she probably gave the first music courses out at Point Grey. And this fueled a certain amount of resentment that she was never actually on the faculty at UBC, that she was good enough for the uh, continuing education courses, but, um, but never was actually a, a professor at, at the university. I don't know that in the, full, in, in the great scheme of things it mattered all that much because um, once the war was over, she began her decade-long process of trying to um, stubbornly engage with um, the song makers of the Pacific Northwest tradition, particularly in and around um, easily accessible by boat or by float plane mm -hmm. in Vancouver. Uh, I did, she didn't get up to the, the far north or the Tlingit areas and things like that, but, but she did, um, did cultivate people yeah. in many, many communities. And um, again, this is legend, but also I think has an emotional truth. 
she got absolutely nowhere <laughs> to begin with. It wasn't, you know, please sing your ancestral songs for me. Um, there are all sorts of issues around that, but the story is that she persevered and she spent, m had many unsuccessful trips, many unsuccessful uh, attempts to be taken seriously, to be able to uh, engage with the music. And finally, and that's the important part of this wonderful show here at the, uh, at the Bill Reed, um, she had a breakthrough with the great chief Billy Asu from uh, Quadra Island. And uh, he contacted her um, and essentially uh, said, I don't know that my songs are going to survive. The Asu family were very, very successful, um, but the idea of the ancestral music and the skills that it take to, takes to learn that ancestral hereditary music were such that he wasn't sure that it would survive by the methods that it had survived lo these many centuries. And so if you would like to bring your machine, um, I will sing for you. It was his, it was his choice to do this. Um, and uh, that's then, I think, broke the log jam, and the great collecting years begin in the late 40s and extend through the 50s. There are many star, um, Dr. Halpin always used to call them song maker chiefs, uh, because they're not just singers, they're people who are in a position, a social position, to be able to inherit repertoires and uh, and perform and um, this fascinated her and led to then the as she was recording uh, materials she would then um, start to formulate a theory of how this operated in uh, the societies and what types of songs there were because just as I can make in a Western European context and say there's opera and there's chamber music and there's symphonies, they all have their own different attributes and, and uses. Well, in um, Halpern came to realize that in uh, West Coast First Nations music, we have songs that represent the totemic animals. We have songs that represent certain secret society dances. We have songs that are used to invite people to a winter dance, potlatch songs. Um, I, I, some of the research I did under her supervision was on the potlatch songs, a relatively insignificant genre. I might add. I'm not trying to, uh, trying to say that these are, are the greatest works of the, the repertoire, but uh, she began through the idea of, of recording and preserving to then try and come up with intellectual filing cabinets to try and put songs to compare and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It sounds like uh, Chief Asu was, as you say, the, the breakthrough. And once his seal of approval was granted, it seemed like that opened doors for, for her to speak to others. I think that's absolutely the case. I think it was his authority um, that, um, that, changed, uh, that changed everything. And, you know, how many songs do we have from how many song maker chiefs in the, in the, in the Halpern archive? Hundreds. Um, there is a very large cache of Billy Asu songs. There's a large cache of Mungo Martin songs. There are songs from uh, multiple other singers, but Martin and Asu are the two biggest names. And as I know the collection, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, caches of material are from those, those two singers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um. Uh, okay, so <laughs> do you feel that there's anything You else? haven't been able to get a word in edgewise, have, have been, you? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it's time to turn to the audience and see if there are questions that people have they'd like to know more a bit about uh, Dr. Halpern and her, her work. Yes? I'm wondering what I knew, uh, I don't know very much, but I knew that 
songs are private property and they cannot be used by anybody else. So how did she get the uh, approval from the uh, indigenous people to use them? Well, in this instance, it's as simple as the person who owns the song saying, I will now sing them for you so and you're... No, 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 no sell, just they'd sing they in two. Them. She... Maybe you, I'll just repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, our audience member has, uh, has noted that songs belong to specific individuals, to specific families, um, and is curious how Dr. Halpern was able to get permission to document those, record those songs. Yeah, exactly. Well, if we look in the exhibit, you can see her first recording apparatus down at the end of the hall, which is a uh, machine that uh, cuts one-of-a-kind um, uh, recordings. 78 recordings. And um, she would, when Billy Asu, when Chief Asu said, come and, and I'll sing for you, it was with the understanding that she would bring, bring her equipment. And um, that's how these songs were then preserved. Uh, but yes, um, I have a decent ear. I could probably sing you several songs. I would never dream of doing it because they're not mine to sing. So she had to get permission in writing probably? No, no one did it in writing per se in those days, but the permission was he did it. So she went to Port Lutches and She went usually to people's homes uh, and recorded them there. The microphones, uh, it would be lovely to think that we could have gone to an actual winter dance and record, but, but that wouldn't have worked. So these are, are often done at the kitchen table. They're just, um, let me turn the machine on. If anybody's interested in this, you can hear on several of her um, Folkways recordings, Folkways Smithsonian recordings, you can hear her engaging with the people who own the songs. And, well, what sort of song is that? Oh, it's a Hamatsa song. Um, is it, and you, you can, she left in several instances in those recordings, she left the dialogue as she's uh, working with, engaging with, is probably the right word, the singer, so you can see the process. Um, in ethno, if I can just have a, a, a little pull back here, uh, we call this field work, <laughs> and there are people who can do it, like Dr. Halpern, and there are people like me who were designed to want to analyze things in the comfort of a university library. It takes a very special personality, uh, which has to be a combination of uh, profoundly respectful, utterly engaged, um, totally sympathetic. It is no small skill, and all sorts of people tried and failed to uh, to collect, I'm not using that word in tip, I wish I had a better one, but collect in quotation marks music from First Nation singers and all sorts of people failed. But she started in the late 40s and she was still collecting in a tiny way um, as late as my working with her in the late 70s. You know, if anybody w had a song that she would say, well, sing it into the but the bulk of the recording is, is late 40s, 50s. And I have to say, this is hugely important. And, and I'm going to get all historian -y here for a second. Because we know when the potlatch, when the winter dances were banned. One of the great catastrophes of Canadian cultural history. This was a tradition which took many, many, if you were going to be a singer who could inherit the songs, it took many, 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 many years to learn how to do it right. And um, when that tradition goes underground, things are forgotten. Now, the ages of Sue and Martin in the late 40s, late 50s, these are, she collected at just the moment when these old receptacles of centuries of tradition, we have reason to believe they were still doing it in the way that had been done back in the day. And that makes it even more important that she was able to preserve these things at that particular time. Um, mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Yes, please. Yes. 
the question is how she would have encountered these songs while in Vienna. Uh, ver various of the, um, the, the real grandfathers of, uh, of comparative musicology were aware of what uh, happened on the West Coast. And we have people collecting in the, in the end of the 19th century. And that's how this would have been mentioned. Uh, there, Franz Boas is the big name. Uh, but there were others, and uh, so she would have um, been taught that as part of her uh, musicology courses. No, no. There were some recordings made. There were there were wax cylinders made, uh, many of which were um, improperly kept by the National Archives mm. and are no longer playable. Uh, various people tried to transcribe. That gets into a whole interesting musical conundrum, which was part of what I was doing in my work with her, uh, because um, if you have a mindset that says, we have do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, <laughs> and maybe C, C sharp, D, E flat, E, <laughs> semitones and tones. Remember your, your, your Toronto Conservatory theory. Um, if you have that type of mentality and you hear this stuff and, can, and are programmed to hear it that way, that can cause problems in the transcribing process. And that's where in the last phase of her research, she was such an enthusiast for uh, using electronic means to verify what uh, her ear told her about the fact that these songs had notes in them that don't fit in the European 12 tones. 12 tones. Yeah. Did she go into the interior at all? I just read Wendy Whitwater's book, and James Tate, T-E-I-T, Tate, I'm not quite sure what it is, mm -hmm. did, I don't know how, if he recorded, but he did a lot of um, moving around in that area. Yeah. Both, I don't know how many languages, and, and it talks in the book about him having people Right. I'm unaware of her working with any of the interior groups. That doesn't mean that she didn't try, uh, but um, I don't recall anything coming from that geographical proposition. She was mainly dealing with the coastal edge. The Kwakwakwak were among the, the tribes, that, the, the nations that Bo has recorded, right? Yes. I, I mean, that they had been like one of the most studied groups, she, she mentions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, if I remember correctly, and forgive me if I'm getting, getting f fuzzy in my old age, I think uh, a bunch of Bella Kula, maybe okay. Bella Bella singers, were taken back to Berlin before the First World War, which uh, seems slightly appalling in some ways, but in other ways it, it shows the esteem, or shows the interest that the grandfathers of the ethnomusicological discipline uh, felt for for this uh, this music this was considered to be important stuff and so again that to me uh, comes up with well you're here in Vancouver why wouldn't you <laughs> right yeah. yes question were there nations or communities that she wanted to work with and, and never was able to Yes, <laughs> I could say that one with a real quick, simple answer. There were, there were, you know, there are successes and there are failures, and we won't go into uh, what the failures were because the successes are so remarkable. But yes, there were approaches that just didn't didn't work. What about the actual uh, local Vancouver I believe there were. I believe there were some, co the, the question was, were there anything in the sort of urban Vancouver catchment area? Um, I think she had a couple of reels of Coast Salish materials, but um, I think her enthusiasm for the, um, the Cape Mudge, the Alert Bay, uh, was, was, so, was so overwhelming, that was the big thing. She did do a recording of, uh, and we used the term from 50 years ago, Nutka, and she did, her last recording was um, on Haida songs, but not all of them were sung by Haida singers. Some of them had been traded, but uh, that was the, the fourth recording. So the recordings, uh, the first one, which was 
this may be the only time I get to record, put these things on recordings for folkways now Smithsonian, was called Indian Music of the Pacific Northwest. Then came Quiet Music, um, and we have two of those. And the, or sorry, then we have that one, then we have the Nootka, then we have the last one, which is the, uh, the Haida. And those are long playing uh, uh, boxes or they were originally two long playing recordings per box with copious notes and uh, they were done up by the wonderful uh, nonprofit recording company Folkways uh, which was um, another um, uh, fabulous thing and when the proprietor of Folkways uh, was winding down he put everything into the Smithsonian and these recordings are still available through the Smithsonian. So I have a question about that. It's it's one thing for Dr. Halpern to sit down with the chiefs and, and record them and study it for academic purposes and store it in the archives. It's another thing for it to gain wide release through a record label, mm -hmm. even though Folkways is a nonprofit and is focused on this kind of work, but I, I wonder what kind of conversations or permissions would have gone into that, and if there, you know, it's because it seems like something that wouldn't happen today. It it might not, but you know, and and I'm, there were discussions, obviously, um, whether there were formal legal releases and things like that. That that's for um, somebody who's interested in contract law to dig up in the archives. But um, when this exhibit opened uh, in the fall. Um, there was a moment which struck me as one of the most emotional moments in my long life because one of the participants who was here doing dances celebrating the opening of the exhibit um, brought out a little record player and said, now I'm sure none of you have ever seen one of these before, but this is called a record player. And uh, he said, this is how we learned our song. We learned them from Ida's recordings. And I was just absolutely gobsmacked at, at this thing, the notion of young people putting on these recordings after school and learning this invaluable, wonderful music from that. And it was, I had a little tiny part of doing that. I, I, I helped. And it was just so amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just one more question. Um, I have a friend who is a musicologist, and she recorded some of the music. I don't know if you know anything about Wendy Stewart. Oh, I do know. Uh, the question is, um, do I know anything about Wendy Stewart? Wendy and I were in the same class at UBC briefly. Um, now that dates me, not her. <laughs> but yes, I do know about her work. And yeah. Well, she produced um, with the interest of Moash and his Folkways recording, she produced these four record albums and she chose the repertoire. I was only in on the last two, but um, you know, we, she wanted to give these things as samplers to the world. <laughs> And so she chose her, her songs appropriately from her larger collections as giving representative samples. Again, we're going back to the 70s uh, and early 80s, um, late 60s as a matter of fact for the first one, and doing a two-album, or a two-record album was a big, big deal. Uh, so it was, it was a sense of, we're going to do this. I don't think she ever envisioned that the entire collection would be um, <clears throat> put into that degree of uh, availability. But um, one of the things that concerned her profoundly in the last three or four years of her life was um, a feeling that she had been entrusted by the great song makers uh, and that she had to make sure that these materials would be preserved in, uh, forever and properly preserved. So ultimately, um, 
and it was ultimately, the negotiations took a while. The decision was that the provincial archives of BC would be the proper place for all of the tape recordings, all of the um, real -to hand cut, reel to reel, plus the research materials. There's all sorts of horrible things that near my attempts at transcribing something and whatever to be found, and I apologize for that. But everything was bundled up and taken to the provincial archives. And there's quite an interesting um, guide to the accessibility of who's able to use these materials, which she felt was in keeping with the, the um, <sighs> implicit copyright, I guess is the phrase I'm going to say, of these materials. And uh, so um, it's, it helps if you're First Nations to get access. It helps if you're a musicologist to get access. Uh, she felt um, a moral responsibility to the, uh, to the materials. Um, the, her research, that was another story, but the materials themselves, this was the, these were the jewels. And, and to further on that, the, um, in recent years, the uh, BC Archives has worked with the families, the Mungo Martins family, the Asu family, uh, individuals have come over to the archives and, and gone through the collection and, and made notes, correcting things and clearing things up, um, and have also made use of the material for their own you know, cultural revitalization efforts. Um, and the collection in 2017 was submitted to uh, the Canadian UNESCO uh, Heritage of the World Registry. Um, also, uh, following, I guess, towards the end of Dr. Halpern and George Halpern's lives, their more personal uh, materials, uh, how they came to Canada uh, and so forth, their lives in Vienna, those materials went to the SFU archives. So there's some here, some there uh, in both sites. Yeah, the SFU is relating to them as people and their journey and their lives and their families. Uh, and then the everything of the First Nations materials, that's in Victoria, uh, and rightly so. And, and you know, we all try and do the best thing we can in our wills, and we try and foresee every possibility, but things change. And um, I think the feeling was the provincial archives of British Columbia were a very respectable place to uh, safeguard uh, when when they were no when she was no longer here, and it seems to have worked worked beautifully. I remember when the announcement about the UNESCO thing came through and thinking, oh, how much she would have loved knowing that. And then I gave myself a quick shake and said. Oh, she didn't need to know that. She knew it all along, that this was part of the greatest heritage of music, one of the great heritages of music anywhere. And, um, you know, in fact, she would have just said, well, it's about time. <laughs> because she had utter, utter faith that this was a profoundly important musical tradition. And we were talking earlier about the importance of this centuries-old thousands of millennia old musical tradition and how Dr. Halpern's training in Vienna, her sense of education, the, the educational uh, tone of her uh, columns and, and uh, radio pieces kind of fit into a piece. And, and when we look at the Smithsonian uh, recordings, they had very extensive essays that were trying to get people to understand what the music was about, what was happening there. How, how, that seems to be all connected in her, her approach. It, it certainly became all connected. It was a holistic thing. I would divide the research, um, the, the life in British Columbia and the research into really three phases. The first, well, probably four phases because there's phase zero, which is spent meeting people and getting to know and getting to be trusted. Then comes the great collecting years. Now, we don't sort of stop those dead at a certain date, but that morphs into, I need to figure out how this music operates. And she worked um, like any good university researcher. You know, you think of, uh, of, of a great um, uh, chemist or nuclear physicist. They don't 
work as an individual doing everything. They put together teams to be able to do the research. And there were many people involved in, in aspects of the research long before I came into the picture. Um, and so that's part of then developing uh, a working theory of the various musical genres, the animal songs versus the Hamasa songs versus the potlatch songs. Um, also, notions of a outsider's perspective of the music theory of this music. How does it work? Are there scales? Are there rhythmic patterns? Uh, how do they use words? This starts developing after the collecting, obviously. It's post facto. But then we have multiple people working on aspects of those. And then um, in the last 10 years or so, um, she had very strong feelings about a number of elements of the music. and had received a certain amount of criticism from other people in the field who said things like, oh no, you're, you're just listening to old guys. Their pitch isn't as good as it used to be. Or, or, oh no, that can't be the way the rhythm works or whatever. And she became quite stubborn about that. And fortunately, um, this is right about the time that we're starting to get much more sophisticated electronic toys to analyze what in an objective way, what we might not hear unless we had uh, exceptional hearing. One of the, my assignments um, was to look at situations where we had spaces between a C and a C sharp, if that's the best way of explaining it. How can you divide a semitone up into even more layers? And we had a little tuner made for me which had punch cards, which would give a tenth of a semitone increments. So I could match what I was hearing on a recording and say, that's 30 one hundredths higher than C sharp. I got reasonably good at this and could, could split a semitone into four or five myself just by ear when I was working with this. But then Fred Lieberman, a ethnomusicologist in those days at the University of Washington, had a whole lot of computer toys at his disposal and he took m many tapes down and produced uh, elaborate uh, printouts. Again, the reason I can say with a certain degree of, 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 uh, of honesty that she wouldn't have been surprised that this was considered a UNESCO world treasure, she wasn't at all surprised that the computers found what she already knew, that there were microtones, sorry for the terminological notion, but that things were done very intentionally and that indeed this was part of the artistry of the performance. She saw this uh, from day zero, but as the th three phases of her work unfolded, it became more, uh, there was more ammunition for saying this is the way, the way it operates. And that's what those notes are, are starting with. To begin with, in the first recordings, the notes are, are more about the type of song we're singing, where it fits in social ritual, da 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 da. By the time we get to the last recordings, we're showing printouts of sonograms of the way the voice makes certain sounds. We're showing computer assessments of pitches and so on and so forth. All of this was part of her belief that this music deserved to be analyzed in the most rigorous ways that she could bring to, to play because it was that important. Question. Um, did she have? I, I know you were of great assistance to her. Um, did she have any ma any Aboriginal people helping her? Yes. Yes. She would always try and get people who could first of all translate and tell what the song text was. Oh, or could be asked about aspects of the way it would be performed. Do you perform that with this in this sort of situation? As I say, if you want to see how she would w get this information, uh, the uh, particularly the Haida recording has many conversations that uh, rather elliptically go through these sorts of things with First Nations uh, people who are they sung for her or who know the song. What those people, whether indigenous musicologists. Not at that point. Uh, there are now. No. Yeah, absolutely. No. Oh, let's let them speak for themselves. But we're getting all s there. Are, there are a number of different tr strands going into, and of course, it depends on where you're from too. If you're dealing with a plains woodlands tradition, there are people studying that as opposed to people from the west coast, and so yeah. 
did the did the indigenous people um, um, or, or were they upset that she was using Western theories to um, analyze their music, or did, or maybe they there were so few who were interested, or, or because of the Canadian government um, trying to change the um, background of the indigenous people. Uh, I think you're. I think your original comment, there weren't a lot of people that were particularly interested in that. Um, the, this sort of drilling down musicologically is a pretty rarefied study and of interest mainly to people who are interested in it as opposed to, you know, um, I could go in and go to Friends of Chamber Music on the 7th and do a three hour analysis of the first movement of one piece that they're going to play. Most people are there to hear the piece and don't want that type of academic study. Um, they have nothing against it, but that's the same proposition. Um, a certain interest and, and um, a little bit of amusement, maybe, in, in some instances. I have a, a story that, that, that I can tell if we've got the time to flibble a bit. Um, I was working with somebody who had been brought in as a translator, and I felt I had discovered something important about um, a, a very complicated series of rhythmic patterns that were going on in a certain song. Um, I could express it in Western European theoretical terms. That was not the point. But I wanted to know whether this was a shared perception. And I said to the gentleman we were working with, I said, you know, I think I can, you know that Hamatsu song of Mongo's? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, I think I can do the beats along with it. And he, of course, was thinking, silly white boy, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> but he said, oh, yeah. And I said, as a matter of fact, let's put it on the cassette. And I'll try, and I had to use my notes to beat this complicated thing along with it. And I did pretty well. And then I made a terrible, terrible mistake. And instead of going, I went, and of course, that threw everything out. And our informant just howled with laughter and said, don't feel bad. All the young guys do that. <laughs> Well, actually, that's a really important thing to say because it says that's the right way. And there is a right way. And it's hard. <laughs> mm. So that, uh, now I had to come at that through the way I would approach that with my background and my approach. Someone within the community would just be sitting doing that song for years until I got it absolutely right. The result is the same. The song is the song, and there is a right way, and so on and so forth. So, but, uh, but the way we come out finding that was, was different. I think we're supposed to wind say, down. Yeah, yeah, I think we've hit our, our mark. Do um, you have any final thoughts you want to share? Well, just uh, the obvious one, which is to thank the gallery, and thank you, Michael, for, for putting this wonderful thing together. Um, I think it's probably obvious that um, Ida Halpern and her husband George changed my life immeasurably for the better. I feel very grateful and humble to be here. I hope I haven't misrepresented anything. And uh, uh, it's just, you know, when one's talking about things that happened 40 years ago um, that change one's life, one can't help but be a little bit sentimental about it all. And it's uh, just a great joy for me to have been a small part of this, um, this interesting, fascinating, and very Vancouverian saga. Well, thank you, David, for being our guest today and for sharing uh, so much insight into this period of your life and this, this, these amazing people. Uh, thank you again to all our supporters, to our guests here in, pre in person, to our guests online to the Bill Reed Gallery for collaborating and hosting this exhibit. Um, it's been an amazing journey, and we hope that everyone who will have an opportunity to come and check out the exhibit, it's on until March 18th, 19th. Come on down between now and March 19th uh, to see the exhibit. Um, yeah, 
it's been a wonderful time and uh, thank you very much.